All right. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. Thank you so much for coming out and uh, for being willing to come and gather together to worship this morning. I apologize for a little bit of the late start. We're actually having a little bit of a, of a electrical technical problem right now. It's being worked on, but uh, the words will actually not be behind me here. So we're going to so, so we're going to have to go, uh, uh, go uh, we're able to use the hymn book for a couple of the, of the songs we'll sing this morning and, and a couple of the other ones. Uh, we're going to depend on your memories, um, <laughs> and uh, I think we can do that, all right? So, but for our first song, we're going uh, we're, we're to begin this morning with a couple of songs of praise. The first one, one that we all know well, How Great Thou Art, it's number 801 in your hymn book. So if you would, go ahead and grab your hymn books, and let's stand to our feet, and let's praise our Lord together.
Good morning. It's good to see everybody. We'll try that one more time. Good morning. I think we fed you all donuts this morning. You should be awake this morning. Um, it's good to see everybody. And, uh, you know, we, we do on uh, each, each month, on the first Sunday of the month, have a donut break in our Sunday school hour. Part of that is, the reasoning is, well, I'll say part of that is because the teenagers ask for it a lot. Um, part of that is also because we encourage the fellowship in our Sunday school groups. And we are thankful for that. We think that's important for you to have the time to be able to, to, to gather and talk together and fellowship together in those Sunday school times. And so if you, and it gives a chance to highlight our Sunday school classes. So if you are um, not involved with a, an adult Bible study group or a, a children's Sunday school class, there is a little informational sheet in the, in the bulletin this week that will tell you which classes are doing what, and we encourage you to, to jump in there. Part of the benefit of a Sunday school class is not only the further, further education for you and for your children, but it's also the opportunity for the togetherness, uh, the one anotherness of the church. In those smaller settings, it's not all the big congregational gathering, but you're in a smaller setting where you can discuss things and have conversation together and pray together, and so we, we encourage you to strongly consider that for your family. Um, and just a moment, we're going to have a testimony regarding that as well. One other thing you're going to notice in your bulletin is our, our February scripture verse that we're memorizing. How many of you got down January's verse? Good. Romans 5, 1 and 2 was our scripture memory verse for uh, January. And now we're jumping into the February's verse out of Psalm 107, verses 8 and 9. Let me read it with you and then explain why we chose this for our February verse. But it says, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. Part of the aspect, the biblical hope, as we rejoice in hope this year, part of that, and you look through the scriptures, is that hope is founded upon who God is. His character, his attributes, and a key attribute that we find great hope in is his goodness. The Lord is good. And so to have some scriptures that remind us as we hide that in our heart, that we would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness. And so I encourage you to take that little card. There's more of those if you'd like extras. If you want something to put in different places in your house or up on your refrigerator or in your car, um, to, to have that there so you can memorize Psalm 107, verses 8 and 9. And then we'll quote that together in our evening services throughout the month. Um, so we hope you'll make, take advantage of that. There's other notes in the bulletin that you can be aware of. Things t t taking place coming up here soon with men's ministries and ladies' ministries, children's ministries. And um, so you, you want to take a note in those things. I want to say as well just a word of welcome. And thank you for joining us to worship together. Uh, for those uh, that are here today in the auditorium and for those that are tuning in by way of live stream, thank you for joining us to worship together. One thing that we wanted to do um, this year as we, we went away on a staff retreat recently, we're just discussing different aspects of ministry, is we wanted to, to allow uh, you to hear from other folks of what some of the impacts of ministry has made upon them, to have some testimonies. And so at different points of the year, we're going to have different people give testimonies, uh, just share a little bit about what a, a certain ministry meant to them. And to kind of highlight that ministry. Uh, today being a day that we're highlighting a little bit in an aspect here. Our Sunday school ministers, we're going to have Ben Hagen's going to come and share in some moment what that has meant to him. And then as our, our ladies ministers are getting ready to launch back into a ladies Bible studies and some ladies ministries. Uh, we're going to have Katrina Peck come after Ben and share uh, a little testimony about uh, the ladies ministry. And so I'm going to ask Ben if you'd come and, and share at this time. Uh, what Sunday school has meant to you, and then followed by Katrina. Morning, it's good to see you all this morning. I'm here on behalf of the Sunday school programs this morning. Again, as Pastor said, my name is Ben Hagen. I'm not wearing my deacon hat this morning. I'm wearing my Sunday school hat. But we have classes here for any age from 2 to 92. I think you can see that. There's four children's classes. The teen class, which is the one I teach, 
and then there's three adult classes. And I know how I've been blessed uh, just even studying my Sunday school lessons and things, and I think I learn as much or probably more than the kids. And as Pastor said, yes, the teens do ask about Donut Sunday. In fact, Hayden Walker said, did you bring anything this morning? Because usually I make cookies or brownies or something. He said, I'm starved right now, and I can't wait for donuts. But I think he survived. He went to the kitchen or had one of the girls go to the kitchen and get him a little pack of cookies to tide him over. But uh, just put that plug in there for you too, Hayden. But uh, anyways, growing up, in, uh, I can remember my Sunday school teacher in my elementary years, and it was at a different church. It was a uh, church that preached the word of God. But anyways, I was blessed to have a faithful Sunday school teacher. Her name was Mrs. Lynn. And the whole class was boys at the time. So you can imagine the triumphs and uh, some of the adventures that we gave her. But anyway, she instilled in us the importance. And she had no children of her own. So we became her spiritual children. And someday I'll get to thank her in heaven when I'm there. But uh, what a blessed soul. She remembered my birthday every year. Up until the time I was married even, she was still sending me birthday cards till she went into a home and she was no longer able to send me cards anymore. But she instilled in us the importance of memorizing scripture at that time. In one of the verses is Psalm 119, 11, Thy word have I hid in my heart. You guys are all mouthing it, so say along with me. Then I might not sin against thee. And it's important how those verses ring true and come back to you at times in your life. And I think it's so important that we get together, as Pastor said, in fellowship and Sunday school time. I know in our Sunday school hour in the teens, we always start out with a praise and prayer time. And we pray for our uh, teacher of the month, which this month is Amanda Caton. If you see Amanda Caton, thank her for being a teacher of the month. And our missionary of the month is Mark and Gina Morris. We also pray for, pray for our missionaries of the month as well as other missionaries from time to time. We also have a verse in our teen Sunday school class 2 Timothy 1, 7, For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I watched some of the teenagers because some of their lips were moving when I said it, so I appreciate that. A plug for you guys as well. But it's so important for us to be here each and every Sunday morning. I know many of you come for church, maybe not for Sunday school. We would like to say to you, you're welcome to come to a Sunday school time because that is a time of fellowship. And I know sometimes in the summer I'll take a month off and go to Doug Olson's class. I know there's other classes. I know Jesse's running one right now. Lucy Werder's running one, adult classes. So seek out one of those. But I know how blessed I am just to even be able to sit in a Sunday school class and learn from time to time during that month. And I know we all have excuses. If some of you might have excuses why you don't attend Sunday school, they don't hold water by far. Uh, I know some people will say, well, I do my devotions on Sunday morning, and that takes the place of Sunday school. No, it doesn't. Get up a half hour early, do your devotions, and get here to Sunday school class. Or the one thing that I tried with my dad one time is I said to him, I'm going all night bowling with some friends. I don't think I'll be able to get up in the morning and go to Sunday school. Guess what? He said, if you can't go to Sunday school, you're not going all night bowling either. So those excuses do not hold water. We've heard them all before. We would appreciate you showing up for Sunday school, being a part of our Sunday school programs here. If you really want to get together and know the body of the church and how to pray for people effectively, be here on Sunday mornings at 930. So I expect to see you guys and you guys and you guys here next Sunday. Thank you. Good morning. As Pastor Scheit mentioned, my name is Katrina Pecht. A lot of you know me as the mom with the twins. Um, they're downstairs in the nursery right now, and we have a four-year-old daughter as well. Um, I wanted to share a little bit on the women's ministry here at First Baptist Church, uh, but first I wanted to give a bit of my background. Before marrying my wonderful husband, Steve, I lived in Lancaster County, which is about three hours from here. I attended a very large church of over 1,500, and I had many strong Christian friends there, lots of opportunities to get involved in, 
And so it was a hard transition for me moving up this way into what felt kind of like the boonies. <laughs> um, and I just obviously I had no friends, no connections other than obviously my husband and his family who were and are a huge blessing in my life. And I slowly got to know people up this way and make friendships, but the friendships and friends I made just never seemed to fully share the same beliefs and values I held as a conservative Christian. And it just always made me end up longing for those friendships I held back in Lancaster. But then we started attending First Baptist Church, and all of that began to change. Soon after attending, I started going to the ladies' Bible study, which is also known as Titus Two Women, and just getting involved in other various ladies' events and so forth. It was then that I finally started making true connections and friendships with other like-minded and godly women, and no longer was I homesick for what I had because it finally felt like this was home. The in-depth studies, the discussions, the fellowship at Titus Two Women, it's encouraged, it's inspired, it's challenged and convicted me. My husband can attest to the fact that I can leave home to go to Bible study after a very long day with the kids, a very stressful day, um, only to come back being refreshed, recharged, and renewed, and just ready to face the challenges that arise in life. I just know I'm a better mother and a wife and simply have a stronger walk with the Lord because of this ministry. And so I'm up here just encouraging all you ladies, if you've never been involved in Titus Two Women, to please give it a try. It might just make a difference in your life, as I know it has mine, and I just really believe you will be glad you did. And you can sign up for the Ladies Bible Study out there in the foyer. Thank you. Morning. Our scripture reading this morning will be out of 1 Peter, verses 17 through chapter 2 into verse 3 of chapter 2. So starting in verse 17. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers but with the previous blood of but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot who indeed was for, foreordained before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times for you who through him believe in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever, because all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as a flower of the grass. The grass withers, and its flowers fall away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babies, desire the pure milk of the word, that, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being able to come and to worship you. Lord, we think of the weather outside, just for giving us safety as we came. We pray for safety as we return home. Lord, we're just so thankful that uh, in the world that we live in today, we have your word and uh, just that we can lean back on you when all things uh, seem to fall apart. Lord, we think of the Hay family and just uh, the wonderful ministry that Norma was. And Lord, we just think about that as uh, she just led such a life of uh, prayer and maybe that would be an inspiration to the rest of us that we could take up that pedestal ourselves and be prayer warriors such as uh, those who come before us. We think of our missionaries, Lord, and all the different things they're going through. We think of uh, Jim and Terry as they head back to the missions field here soon and just 
praise you and thank you for uh, everything that you've been able to do in their lives and us as a church being able to help us out and their other supporting churches as well. And just pray for them as they head back. We pray for the message that Pastor has prepared for, for us. And we just think that uh, we could use this in our hearts, that you would give him the words to speak, that we would uh, be able to use it in our lives, and that it would uh, uh, make us better Christians from it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we stand again and we'll continue to sing and worship our Savior? Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. Savior allows us to come just as we are as sinners. And when we come, he gives us the victory. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the sting of death is sin and the power of death is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. As we begin to sing our final song, children, you may be dismissed to your children's church class.
to the words of this song as Melissa sings.
with a thousand songs, proclaiming the glories of Calvary. With every breath, Lord, how I long to sing of Jesus who died for me. Lord, take me deeper into the glories of Calvary. Appreciate that. I've not heard that song before. Take me deeper into the, into the glories of Calvary. What a great truth to be thinking about and praying. I want to invite you to turn to, to 1 Peter 1. We're going to continue in our series together there. And uh, we're going to look at a little bit, uh, a little bit bigger chunk today, verses 18 down through chapter 2, verse 3. There is a statement that I have held on to and, and found helpful during counseling and when uh, working with people through relationship struggles and, and th things of that nature. And the statement is this, it is that hurting people hurt people. And, and you can kind of see the, the idea of that. Um, uh, and I've seen this when, when grieving, someone that's grieving might speak harshly to someone or someone who's gone through some different trauma or abuse and They've become hardened and self-preserving or harsh with others to, the, around them. And on and on that goes. That aspect of hurting people hurt people. And there's a level of, that draws us to have grace in those times. But there's a, a flip side of that that I've also held on to. And that is this, that loved people love people. Let me say that one again. Loved people love people. People. In other words, those who have been selflessly loved deeply and, and they live in that love, they are more prone to extend that love out towards others around them. During World War II, there was a, a Jewish lady who was fleeing. She was in France and she was fleeing from the German Gestapo, trying to flee for her life, to not be taken to a concentration camp. And she happened upon a home of a, um, a, a French Christian lady. The Christian lady welcomed her in and said, uh, you know, told her what she knew what she was going through and said, hey, you need to quickly keep on uh, moving and here's another safe place you could go gather with this group and move on to this safe place. And the, the, the Jewish lady said, There's, it's no use. They're, they're, they're hot on my trail. At some point, they're going to just catch me. And there's no use continuing to, to struggle in this. And the Christian lady said, no, you need to get going. Yes, they're going to find someone here, but it won't be you. It'll be me. I will take your identity and they'll find me. You get going. At that moment, the Jewish lady figured out what was going on and, and said to her, asked this question, why, why would you do that for me? To which the Christian lady responded, it's the least I can do. Christ has already done, so, done that and so much more for me. <clears throat> well, as things progressed, the Jewish lady did escape and made it out. But that Christian lady that took that identity and was taken into custody, um, she ended up being taken to a, Christian, or to a concentration camp and within six months um, ended up losing her life there. And that Jewish lady heard that and ended up... Um, committing her life to Jesus Christ as a result of that. But that, I, I tell you that, I give that illustration this morning, that story this morning, to illustrate that that's someone who had experienced deeply the love of Jesus Christ, who understood, as we just heard the song, take me deeply into Calvary to understand the depths of that love, to understand that love deeply, to be able to extend that love back out to others. And so then that tells us that Christians are the best equipped to love since we've experienced and tasted so great a love. Well, what I want to do now is really in this text, we're going to find Peter draw that truth out in a, in a, in a deeper form. And I'll be honest, I, I wrestled with this text more than normal in my studies this week. Um, for the sake of that, 
it, it seems sometimes almost disjointed as you read this portion of scripture, like, like that Peter's talking about our salvation to the blood of Jesus Christ, and then he's talking about loving Christians, and he's talking about the eternal word, and they seem like they don't fit together, or why is that done? And most times when you hear messages preached or commentators discuss this, they, they discuss it from a individual, each individual aspect. But as I studied, I, I came to the conviction that, that Peter is making a holistic discussion, an argument. And so I want to discover it that way and, and, and lay that out with you that way, that there is one main imperative verb in this entire section that we just read today, and that is to love uh, love one another fervently and with a pure heart. Uh, around that, Peter's going to give us the uh, reasons for that. Because of this great Christian uh, new birth that we've experienced, that we are a part of the family of God, as he even has drawn this from our previous, that we have uh, been begotten again into a living hope. That term begotten again speaks of new life. It's the same word that's that's used later on in verse 23, having been born again. So he's wrapping together this aspect of two believers who have experienced a living hope because we are alive in Jesus Christ. We've been forgiven from our sins. And out of that, he's then given some different imperative statements of how does this work out in our Christian lives? What does this mean to us as Christians? And we saw last time the imperative to be holy for I am holy, to conduct ourselves in a Christian manner that would be pleasing to the Lord. Well, now he's going to wrap this together with another imperative to love one another. He's going to emphasize then the way we continue to grow in that love of God and that experience of the love of God. As we just even heard again sung, Lord, take me deeper into that, 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 that reality of Calvary as we discover it in the word of God and so he's going to explain for us what we've been given by our salvation in Jesus Christ the blood of Jesus Christ the immensity of God's love for us he's going to he's going to implore us now you love one another and how you continue to grow in that love is through studying God through his word that you might understand it more deeply and you continue to grow in your ability to love one another better so, so there's, there I've given you the, the sermon in, in kind of a 60 second nutshell, but that doesn't mean we're, we're packing up and going home from there. You have to listen to the rest of it. So, so there's kind of the, the bluff, the bottom line up front. Because of the love of God that you've received in salvation, increasingly love one another as you grow in his word. That's the bottom line. That's what... Peter's drawing out to these believers who were facing difficult times. They were going through struggles and there was situations they were facing that there was difference of opinions how to handle this or that and they were facing persecutions and how imperative that they would love one another and what was going to implore them, what was going to motivate them and encourage them in that love. And so that's where we're going today. And so the question I have is, have you struggled with loving people? Or is that naturally coming for you? Or, or have you struggled with hurting people? And so let's see how to love like a Christian. As we're going to see three things in the text together this morning. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll jump in together. Father, I pray that you'd guide our time. Lord, we recognize that we are frail. We are limited in our understanding. And without your Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth, this would make no sense. Without your Holy Spirit to produce in us the fruit of love, we'd have no capability. Without the understand, the definition of love exp- er, 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 displayed for us through the cross of Calvary, we wouldn't know what love is. So God, I pray that this morning you would illuminate your word to us. Help us to understand what love looks like. That we might be better husbands and wives siblings loving each other family members the body of christ loving each other help us to learn from your word this morning and walk away different and changed because of it it's in your name we pray amen all right so how do we do this 
how do we love better? How do we get better at this? Well, the first thing he's going to draw us to is to remember how much God loves you. In verses 18 to 21, let me start by reading this portion once again with you. He says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. And he's going to start this section with the word knowing. And it actually has a, an aspect of keep on knowing. In other words, keep on reminding yourselves of this truth. Know this and keep knowing it because the reality is, um, you know, we are sometimes forgetful people and we need things repeated to us. You know, sometimes we are forgetful people and we need things repeated to us. God knows that. And so he has established throughout the history of his interaction with people, memorials. He instructed his people to set up memorials. When, when Joshua led the people into Canaan land and they crossed over the Jor through the Jordan on dry ground, Joshua instructed the people in Joshua 4, go take 12 of, one of you from each of the 12 tribes, go take a, a stone and we're going to set up a memorial in Gilgal so that when people ask what mean these stones, we'll tell them about what God has done. When God had them, when they were in, in Egypt and they were... Uh, conducting the first Passover in which they took a lamb and slew that lamb and took the blood and, 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 and put the blood on the doorpost and the lentil and then they had a ceremony in which they consumed that lamb and God passed over them so they were not slain. And God said, I want you to keep this Passover annually that you remember that I'm a God who redeems his people, that I'm a God who takes care of his people and there will be yet one coming as the Lamb of God. It, it's why we partake of the Lord's table. Jesus Christ, just before he left this earth, the, the, the night before, the night that he was betrayed, uh, the night before his death, he gathers his disciples in the upper room. And he gives them an ordinance to perform this, do this as often as you drink it, as often as you take it in remembrance of me, to continue to do this partaking of the Lord's elements because as we would as we take of the bread we remember what he's done and his body being bruised and shredded and nailed to a cross we do that in remembrance of him as we partake of the wine we are reminded of his shed blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary to demonstrate one to demonstrate how much he loves us but two to be the payment for our sins and we remember it. We do that in remembrance of him. And so God has established these memorials. And we're going to see that actually in this text. And so I drew that out a bit further. So he says, know this. Remember these things. Don't forget. It's going to drive you forward into being better to be able to love people. Know from whence you've come. And so this, the, the, the lamb then was a symbol of substitutionary atonement. And so he says there in this aspect of knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot so he's emphasizing the aspect here of this what it cost to be redeemed now we hear that word redeemed or redemption and we probably think of it in a theological terminology. That's a good theological term, redemption, and it is. But to the readers of this letter that Peter is writing to, it had a much more vibrant and emotional attachment to it. In the Roman world of that day, there was, according to estimates, roughly 60 million slaves. Individuals who had either been, been conquered in military conquest by the Romans and were taken into slavery. Individuals who were born into slavery. Individuals who had a debt and had been brought into servitude because of that debt. 
and there was on and on this ongoing. Now, we also need us to say this, that slavery looked very different than what we often think in our minds of slavery. Uh, there was slaves who were doctors, slaves who were lawyers, slaves who were merchants and had conducted themselves in businesses, but they still had a master that they answered to. And they always kept in their minds that they were not free to do whatever they wanted. But they could obtain freedom, possibly. They could obtain freedom by purchasing their own freedom. If they could save up enough money by doing work or doing things, they could purchase their own freedom. If they as well had somebody else purchase their freedom and purchase them, then they could be granted their freedom. There was actually a great movement that was taking place in Peter's day of, 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 a, of allowing free slaves to be set free. It's so much so that the Roman government at that time had to actually put regulations on it. And so there was a strong attachment to this idea of being redeemed, being under and under bondage, but now having freedom. And I think what Peter's doing is he is trying to emphasize to us the position that we were once in, in bondage. And I think sometimes we don't, we don't take the time to consider that, to ponder that we were enslaved to sin and the result of what we deserved, the result of what we've been bought out from is we deserved the wrath of God, a holy God deserving of then eternal wrath in hell. But God bought us out of that. God redeemed us out of that. And so he's trying to draw that out. And I, I think there is an element that if we don't think about what we've been redeemed from, if we minimize sin, we minimize our discussions and understanding about sin and its consequences for human beings, it develops into a shallow Christianity. It is when we begin to think deeply upon what redemption actually means, what we've been redeemed from, that it grows out of that a deeper love of God and understanding that love of God. Joseph Parker, a, a 19th century London pastor, he wrote in an article, The Precious Blood of Christ, he said, where there is no conviction of sin, conviction amounting to the very anguish of the lost in hell, there can be no felt need of, of so extreme a remedy as is offered by the outpouring of the blood of Christ. He goes on to point, and what he's saying in there is, if we don't understand our depravity and our lostness of, of being in sin, the punishment we deserve in sin, then the gospel doesn't really shine forth as that rare and precious jewel. It doesn't seem as something, man, I want to obtain, I'll sell everything to obtain this. It's only when we, we grasp our depravity. It, it, it's, it's like if you ever heard the, the sermon that Jonathan Edwards preached, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. It's, it's when we grasp, and he, as he preached on that, and he preached about people being on the precipice of hell, that they were literally grabbing onto the side of their pews, afraid that they were going to be cast over into hell. When he gave the gospel, there was such a, a, a welcoming reception of that. Because they understood, man, I deserve to be going to hell. And when we grasp that, that's what Parker was saying here. He says, he goes on to point out that when a man feels that, conversely, that he has not sinned deeply, he's in no mood to receive what he considers the tragic appeals of the gospel. But when he feels that he has sinned and is deserving of hell, that he is lost and damned, then his need can be met by nothing other than the, than the sacrificial, personal precious blood of Christ. And so, so that's what Peter's driving out here. Don't minimize what you have. Don't minimize what it costs. And he says, you didn't obtain this by two inadequate means. You didn't obtain this, first of all, he says, by, by corruptible things like silver or gold. This isn't that you got bought by money. Somebody paid enough gold or silver to buy you out of eternal hell. That's not how this was, was obtained. Because that would never be enough. And you didn't obtain it by, he says there, second of all, by your aimless conduct. 
received by tradition from the fathers. In other words, you didn't, you didn't also obtain your redemption by just working good enough. By doing enough of the, the, the rituals or the religious aspects that's been passed down from the fathers from generation to generation. That isn't how you obtain redemption either. So how do we obtain it? How, what, what, did it what did it cost, Peter? How did we get this? He says, but rather you gained it by the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without bl out spot and he was foreordained for the foundation of the world for you in other words what he's telling us is it took the perfect precious lamb of God and his blood had to be shed from the beginnings of the Bible so from the very first time that sin occurred in Genesis chapter 3 God then does the first slaying of a lamb to provide a covering and then we see this sacrificial system. By chapter 4, we see Abel coming and bringing a sacrifice of a lamb. God establishes that with the Passover. God establishes that with the, with the sacrificial system that was established. And on and on it goes through. Isaac asks his father, where is the lamb? And John the Baptist says, behold, when he sees Jesus Christ, behold the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. They recognized that there was yet coming one who would be the perfect lamb. And that lamb just couldn't come and be there. The lamb had to be slain. And the lamb had to have his blood shed as a substitutionary atonement for that sin. That's why in Revelation we find Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter number 5 standing before the throne of God, standing as the lamb as having been slain, and he's standing victorious. And the saints around the throne worship saying, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive honor and glory and power. And so there's this aspect of what did it cost for you to be redeemed? You didn't earn it. You didn't gain it by being good enough. It wasn't simply perishable material things. It cost the very Son of God to come to this earth and be slain. Brutally and viciously slain to be the substitutionary atonement. That's redemption. And you know what's beautiful about this? He tells us God had this all planned before he even created mankind. Before the foundation of the world. This, this was, he, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world. This was the plan. God knew that Adam was going to sin. That there would be a necessity of a sacrificial atonement made. And God said, I've already got that planned out and purposed out. Revelation 13, 8 calls Jesus Christ the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. God knew that you'd be a sinner, that I'd be a sinner. And he loved us yet so much that he still went through the whole plan. But he already had the sacrifice prepared in Jesus Christ who would come and bear that upon himself. Spurgeon said it this way. He said, while the universe lay in the mind of God like a forest of oaks in the cup of an acorn, God purposed to send his son. So God raised him then victorious over sin and death, has glorified our Savior, and, and because he lives, we too shall live, and so that our faith and our hope are in God. So he's drawn us together saying, basically, don't ever forget how much God loves you. No greater demonstration of how much you are loved than the cross of Calvary. I love the way Paul puts it in Romans, where he calls us, in Romans 5, he talks about that, that we, were, we were without strength. We, we could do nothing to save ourselves. He, he calls us the ungodly, sinners, enemies of God. But it says in Romans 5, verse 8, but God commends or demonstrates his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's how much you are loved. Isn't that good to know that you're loved? And loved deeply immensely more than we can grasp and that's why we do need to continue to ponder over that's why we continue to come to, to the to the lord's supper table to continue to remind ourselves 
of what the cost of redemption is. We're going to participate in that tonight over the Lord's table tonight. I love the old hymn uh, by Fanny Crosby that she penned and the realization of her own redemption and the cost that she wrote, redeemed how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through His infinite mercy, His child and forever I am. And then verse 3 says, I think of my blessed Redeemer, I think of Him all the day long. I sing for I cannot be silent. His love is the theme of my song. That's, that's the result. Fanny Crosby does a great, did a great job of vocalizing the, the study of God and putting that into words in response in worship. And that's what, it, that's what the Christian does, is the more we ponder on Jesus Christ. So, so, so Peter's here kind of laying that. Remember how much God loves you. Don't forget that. But then he's going to jump that into now. What does that play out to? He's going to give the imperative, which is then recognize your new ability to love in verse 22. He says there, since you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Let me stop there. But notice this aspect here. What he's going to draw out is that he's going to build upon what we've just known, our, our, our redemption cost. He's going to now draw us into this aspect of love. Now that draws me to a couple questions. First of all, when were you enabled to love? When did this come upon you? When is Peter saying that all of a sudden now you have the capability to love as never before? Well, that began at your salvation. Notice it says there, since you have purified your souls. It's the same grammatical wording as in verse 23, having been born again. And it's kind of a simile of stating the same thing. Since having been born again would actually be an accurate statement there. You were born again by purifying your souls and obeying the truth of the Spirit. In other words, you trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior. And so he's stating an accomplished fact with continuing results. That's the basis for his command to love one another. So you are enabled to love the brethren once you are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. That opens the door to now a Christian reality that now you possess the Holy Spirit who indwells you and is going to start to produce in you what's the first fruit of the Spirit? Love. He's going to equip you to love like God loves. He's going to grow that in you. And so that enablement begins there. And so that's his point. And so when you do surrender to obedience and faith in Christ, you are granted also unto a sincere love of the brethren. And I say unto, even though the New King James says in, through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, the word there for in is actually the Greek word ace. And it means to or toward or unto and so uh, I, that's actually how a lot of other translations put it the new american standard translates it um for a sincere love the king james has unto those i think are actually more accurate there where it's telling us that this is unto something we have been redeemed and now where we purified our souls unto a sincere love of the brethren the truth is an unconverted person is far from having the ability to love, to demonstrate genuine love as a Christian is. John says it this way in 1 John 3, verse 10. In this, the children of God, the children of the devil are manifest. So you've got the two aspects, a child of God and the child of the devil. Here's how they're manifested, he says. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. He said, here's two keys to demonstrate who is those who are not of God. These are the, those of the devil. They don't practice righteousness, and they don't love the brethren. So what we're enabled then, likewise, as Jesus said in John 13, 35, this, by this will all men know that you're my disciples, if you have love one for another. It is love that we are equipped with. So 
When were you enabled to love? It's at your conversion and as you grow in Christ. So who then, the second question, who are we enabled to love? Well, notice it's pretty simple. That it lays it out for us, a love of the brethren. It's translated, actually, that, that phrase, love of the brethren, is actually translated from one Greek word. You're going to recognize it as soon as I state it. It's the word Philadelphia. Now, I, I know, as you have observed things in Philadelphia this last year, it didn't really manifest love. Like it, we're like, oh, wow, that is, no, they had rioting and all kinds of problems in Philadelphia. But the word actually is, comes from two different uh, root words in the Greek. Um, the, the one is philos, meaning warm, affectionate love, uh, kind of a, a family type of a, a love. Um, the other word is adelphos, which means brother. The original meaning of this is um, one born of the same womb. So in other words, I have one biological brother, my brother Aaron, we're born in the same womb. There is naturally out of that a certain affectionate love that we have towards each other. We're brothers, and that is natural in there. But what P Peter is saying here is, spiritually speaking, since the birth of the church, the Bible refers here to fellow Christian believers as brothers and sisters in Christ. In fact, the word brethren is found in the book of Acts almost 40 times to refer to the church. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. So everyone who knows Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is my brother or my sister because we are all spiritually born from the same womb. It's not a physical womb. That's what he says. Not, not a womb that is uh, by corruptible seed but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. In other words, you are born, spiritually speaking, based upon the truth of who God is, revealed to you in the word of God, and what he has done for us in the gospel. And so we are now of the same father. We're brothers and sisters in Christ with the same father. How many of you have seen the, the movie that was put out a few years ago called Fireproof? The Kendrick brothers put it out. Um, and there's a scene in it uh, that makes me laugh. Caleb is the main character, and he is struggling with his salvation with a variety of things. He's a firefighter. Well, he eventually comes to know Jesus Christ. He has a good buddy down at the fire station named Michael. And, and Michael is a Christian who had been praying for Caleb and trying to witness to Caleb. And so Caleb comes to tell Michael, and he says, Hey, Michael, um, I want to tell you something about your, about, about your faith. And he said, yeah, what? He said, I just want you to know I'm in. And Michael's like, what do you mean you're in? Because you can't be halfway in. You can't, are you saying you want to be in or are you in? And Caleb says, I'm telling you, I'm in and I'm all in. And, and he says, Michael says to Caleb, and I find it funny. He says, I can't believe it, man. Now you're my brother. And Caleb kind of looks at him like, what do you mean I'm your brother? And he says, his response is, well, you're my brother from another mother, but now we have the same father. Well, that just confused Caleb even more. But that's the reality. We now have the same father, and so you're my brothers and sisters in Christ. If you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, if you've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ, we're family. We're family. There is, there is a relational love that comes out of family. But we're going to, yeah, yeah, family, sometimes we bicker and fight. Yeah, sometimes family, you, you know, I've seen that in my kids, right? I saw that, in my, I'll just use my brother, I'll t take my kids out of this. Because um, I <laughs> feel like they get, they get the run of illustrations. I saw that with my brother and sister and I. There was many a days where we were like, you know, fighting with each other. But man, if you went, somebody else went to go pick on my brother or my sister, it was game on. We're on the same team. We're going to get you. Um, there's, a, there's just a unity that was there, a bond that was there. And in the same way, as a, as a body of believers, we're, we're united as one. We got each other's backs. We're there to help each other. Hey, what do you need? How can I come alongside you? We learn how to forgive. We learn how to show grace. We learn how to, to love like Christ. And so... 
John puts it this way. He says, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. It's a, it's a demonstration to us. So then, how are we expected to love? I need to quickly hit, touch on this. Here we find, here's the command. Here's where it finally comes in here. Where it says in verse 22, love one another fervently with a pure heart. That's the command. It's the imperative of the section here. And, and this is a different word for love. It's not the philos or the Philadelphia type of a love. This is the word agapao, from agape love. It's a God type love. Well, how does God love us? He, he loves us volitionally and sacrificially. It's a love of the will. There is a natural love that we have as brothers and sisters in Christ, but he also calls us to take that a step higher because of what we have in Christ and to love supernaturally as God loves. That means I'm going to choose to love even when it doesn't feel like I want to love. I'm going to choose to allow the Holy Spirit to grow that in me because I want to love like God loves. Interestingly enough, this word agape is really a, a new term that appeared in the New Testament age period. It was a result of the early New Testament church and this realization of Christian love. So we're called to have a godly love. We're called to love fervently, he says there. Love one another fervently. The term is an athletic term. It means striving with all of your might. Um, you might think of like a football player. We're going to watch the Super Bowl later tonight. And, and there's a dive across the goal line as Patrick Mahomes beats Tom Brady tonight <laughs> and dives across the goal line trying to get that touchdown in. That's that fervency. Every effort is, I'm going to strive at this. I mean, let me ask you, do you love that fervently towards one another? Do you love your spouse? Do you love the friends in the church? Do we love that, that fervently, that hard, that, that, that much energy put into it? That's what he's calling us to. He calls us to love purely. He, he says, with a pure heart. Actually, he even says right before that, a sincere love. The idea there it speaks of unhypocritical. In other words, it's not loving because I'm going to get something back. A pure love is like the love of God that says, I'm giving, and, it, and it's not because I'm giving to get something in return. And then he also calls us to a righteous love. And here's where we're seeing the, the text all tied together as he wraps things and he's, he's flowing with a thought all intertwined as you carry down to chapter 2 and verse 1. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking. He tells us some things that we want to not have. Uh, we're going we're gonna to not have malice, a, uh, this wickedness or a, a desire to hurt someone with our words or actions. We're going to not have deceit. Peter had been keen on that word. It literally was a word that meant to bait the hook. But we're not going to bait people in with our words and trying to trick people or mislead people. There's not going to be hypocrisies. There's not going to be envy. There's not going to be evil speaking. And the word there, evil speaking, literally means to speak down upon or to slander them. It includes gossip. It, it includes anything that would sow discord among the brethren. Not going not gonna to speak down about someone. He says, because what motivates it is love. If I love like God has instructed me to love, if I love pondering what I've been given in Jesus Christ, I'm going to put away malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, evil speaking out of my, out of my life. And you'll notice that all of those are relational aspects to, to our love. So then quickly and lastly then, we remember how much God loves us, we recognize our new ability to love, and then lastly, and here's where he ties in with the word of God, we relish in love through the word here's where you see this point drawn in he's not just all of a sudden jumping into oh by the way the word of god is eternal that doesn't fit right that's not his point this isn't a separate sub point that all of a sudden it's tied to talk about the word of god no he's saying how do we continue to, to grow in this love you were birthed you were birthed out of a knowledge of the, the salvation through the, through the love of the love of god through the word of god 
and you learn about what love is by God's love through the Word of God, now continue to consume the Word of God so that you grow in it. Notice how he even finishes this in verse 3 of chapter 2. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So as sincere as, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the Word, that you may grow thereby so that you can taste better how gracious and how good God is to you. Continue to grow in that. That's the idea that he's drawing forth in this text. And so this is, and I, I, I'm out of time, so I can't break it down entirely. Let me just try to tie in that last part there, that hunger for that. that, that he, he's saying that you were not uh, born again of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever, and he, he demonstrates the eternal nature of God's word, and that is demonstrating us the eternal nature of God and his love for us, and so therefore as newborn babes desire the milk of the word, so we should desire that word of God as well. Now he's not trying to state that the people that Peter's writing to are young newborn babes in Christ. He's not even trying to make a differentiation, as we often hear from this text, between milk and meat. He's trying to emphasize the hunger. That's what he's emphasizing. I want to know how to love better. I want to know how God loves me better. And so I learned that from the word. Listen, you want to grow in love? Read the Bible. It's his love letter to you. He defines how much he loves you. He displays it in his word. And so he says, consume that. That's why Jeremiah 15, verse 16, Jeremiah said, your words were found and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Do, do you love to consume the word of God? Two weeks ago, I came home from a basketball game and I had my my, my sermon notes and my Bible and things on a bookshelf. And I came home to find that my Bible had been taken by my dog and was on the couch with the dog and it had started to nibble on it. Um, it had taken little pieces out of a couple pages and had taken one of the bookmarkers and had eaten it off. And I was not happy. Um, we didn't get along good that night. But it, it, it came to my mind when I was studying this. To consume the word of God, a hunger for it. Now, that's not what he's talking about, obviously. <laughs> right? He's talking about consuming it by reading it. Be in it. Study to, know, study to know your God. Study to know your God. And as you study to know your God, you get to act like God. And you, you love like God. That's the whole point. That, that's Peter's point. We're commanded to love as we recognize who we are in Jesus Christ, what he's done for us, how much we've immensely been loved by the precious blood of Jesus, bought back by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And so therefore, love one another. Love fervently, love sincerely, love purely, and put away the malice, put away the evil speaking, put away the hypocrisies, put away all that stuff, and you continue to grow in it as you consume the word of God and know your God better. So going back to my initial statements, as we said earlier, hurting people hurt people, love people people love people right so who should be the best equipped to love us us and the more we grow in the word of God and our knowledge of him we will love better and better and better and hereby will the community around us know that we're Christians because we love one another hereby your neighbors will recognize man that must be a Christian family because they love each other and they love other Christians the testimony of Jesus Christ is displayed in us by love so that's what Peter's driving at here loved people love people let's pray Father thank you for just the reminder to us again as we need the continued reminders of how much you love us to give your son Jesus Christ as a lamb slain for us we're redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. But also then we're encouraged and mandated to love one another. 
and to grow in that love as we grow in your word. I pray that you'd help us as your people, that your word would not just be something we carry into church on Sunday and set on a shelf Tuesday, or Monday through Saturday, but it would be something we consume, we grow in, that we, we study you and we get to see how much you love us. And we learn better how to love you and to love others. And so God, thank you for this text and this time this morning. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, before we, we close in song here this morning, one thing I, I want to do quickly with you as well is um, I, I want to join our hearts and to pray and love on a, a family this morning. And um, it's a family you know well. It's a family we have endeavored to love deeply. Um, and they're soon going to be leaving us. And that is Jim and Terry Miller. And Jim and Terry have been back for a furlough from South Africa. Um, and while they were here, they discovered Terry's uh, cancer had returned. They began treatments. We're able to come around them um, and pray for them and support them. We just voted on in a recent um, business meeting to, to even cover their medical expenses. And um, we're going to miss them when they're gone, but we're thankful that they're going, if that makes sense, because they're going to be in the center of God's will, serving in South Africa. And I'm going to ask Jim and Terry, if you guys would, would come up, I want to pray with, with you guys and for you guys together um, before you guys head back. They're flying out Thursday morning. Um, I believe pretty early. I think that's a 7 o'clock flight. Is that right? 6.15 a.m. Man, okay. So we're going we're gonna to say goodbye today um, rather than 6.15 in the morning. But we wanted just to let you know how much we love you guys. And we appreciate your faithfulness and fervency for the Lord. And uh, praying for you. We're, we know that you guys, will, you're going to be continuing your treatments as well while you're in South Africa. So there's still going to be challenges ahead, um, but we want you to know as well that your church family is behind you, and we love you, we're praying for you, and uh, we're excited to see God continues to do amazing things, um, to bring healing, to use you guys to bring spiritual healing in people's lives in South Africa, and you guys have been faithful, been a blessing to me, blessing to our family, and so as they head back uh, for this next term, uh, let's, let's pray for them. Anything specific, though, that we could be praying for? Well, let's pray together. Would you, would you pray with us? Father, we are so thankful, uh, once again, just for your love for us. But I want to thank you for Jim and Terry. Thank you that they could come back for this furlough and be able to spend time with their family and to even be able to participate in the wedding of their son and, and um, just to, to have that family time together. God, I thank you that they even were able to discover quickly here the, the, the cancer issue there for Terry and uh, begin the treatments and the processes there. Thank you for the the uh, the good results that came from the bronchoscopy as well. And God, as they prepare to go back now to South Africa to continue to minister for you there, to spread the love of Jesus Christ and the gospel to the people there, and to to equip up saints. I pray that you'd strengthen them for it, Father. We do pray that you continue to be with Terry and for her medical treatments and the processes ahead and. Um, and, and the difficulty that's going to be there of taking chemo uh, on a regular basis. I pray that you'd give her strength and comfort, uh, and with, with Jim as well, that they would um, together know that they're not alone. Not only, not only are we here behind them, but Lord, above all, you are there, and you love them with an everlasting love. And your strength and your goodness is unending, and so I pray that you would encourage them with that and uphold them with that. I pray that you'd give them fruit for their ministry. God, reward them for their faithfulness and their fervor for you. And um, Lord, I pray that you'd bless. Uh, bless as they begin the work in Facenta Crawl, trying to develop that church there, and, or continue the work, I should say, and, and develop that building and, and start ministries there further. And as they continue to train up leaders and all the things that they're involved with. We thank you that uh, your, your word is, is um, sharp and it is 
um, piercing and is helping to also uh, reveal people's need for Jesus Christ. And you're using that through them. We love you. Pray that you give them safety as they even fly back on, on Thursday and help all the preparations as they pack, as they get tests, I'm sure, that are needed to be done, as they say goodbye to their kids and prepare to head home uh, back to Africa. I pray that you just help all that to go well, and we just pray your hand upon them. We love you, Lord, and thank you for this bond that we possess together, even though separated by thousands of miles, we're united in Jesus Christ. And thank you for this brother and sister. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. We'll keep them in prayer, and um, they'll have a busy week of packing up and making all the final preparations. And uh, thank you, church family, for also graciously supporting uh, them and their needs and their medical expenses and the things that they've got going on. And so thank you for that. Let's have a closing song, and then we'll be dismissed this morning. Oh, reminder, tonight is a teen service, and that's always exciting to see teenagers singing together and leading the service, and so you'll want to be a part of that. We also have the Awana ministry taking place tonight at the same time, and so you'll want to be here tonight at 6 o'clock for the evening service. And I believe the teens are having a, an afterglow afterwards. Teens and their families are having an afterglow and going to watch uh, uh, the Kansas City Chiefs beat up on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers um, tonight. And uh, so, but we're, we're looking forward to hearing them tonight in the evening service. We'll be here at 6 o'clock. Aaron, if you go ahead. All right, thank you. Please stand as we close. to mention regarding Jim and Terry, they have prayer guides, uh, prayer cards out there at the Welcome Center. I'd encourage you to pick one up. So continue to pray for them as they head back, and so grab one of those on your way out this morning as well. Continue praying for Jim and Terry. Thanks so much, and you are dismissed.